No, he's okay. He's, he's on his way. Uh, we have a great panel today that we're going to talk about uh, both physical and political infrastructure. As I was just talking to State Senator Jenny Oropesa and saying there's no different. To build infrastructure, you need a political will today. And to have a political will, you need political infrastructure. Um, we're going to get started, even though we're waiting on one of our guests. But uh, uh, first and foremost, sitting immediately to my left is a good friend. We've known each other, I don't even want to say how long. She's a resident of the Westchester area, actually Playa del Rey, has been a community activist for a very long time. And one of those things when you start being a community activist, ultimately someone's going to say, hey, you got to uh, get involved. So uh, Mayor Villaragosa appointed her to be on the airport uh, commission. So she is the commissioner for the airport. Wait, were you there when the plane landed on Monday? The I was there. On Tuesday. That was cool. Yeah. Hey, how many of you went to go see it? See what? The Airbus. Are you are you awake, John? On on uh, on Monday at 9:30. Actually, at 9:28, it landed two minutes early. The uh, the largest passenger airplane uh, landed at LAX for the first time. It was empty though, right? It had about 20 um, staff people on it. And it ultimately can hold 555 people. Could be 800, depending. If, if you're configured, like if you were in Southwest Airlines, it'd be 800. It'd be 800, uh, that's right. right. <laughs> so uh, Val Velasco, uh, a good friend. Uh, one of the most important things is that she is an LMU parent. Her uh, son is currently here at, at uh, LMU. Um, and uh, uh, again, a community activist, airport commissioner, uh, uh, attorney by trade. Don't hold that against her. And... Um, and uh, in, a, in addition, she worked previously in government, worked for uh, at then Councilman Mike Wu. Correct. Okay, so all kinds of different uh, interesting background. Uh, next to her is um, Jenny Oropesa, who is the state senator representing the 28th district, which includes Loyola Marymount University. She is our state senator. Yay. If you have any grievance, any problem with your Cal Grant or anything, she is the one to uh, speak to. She was recently elected to the state senate district this past June and took office de uh, in December of 06. Before that, she served three terms in the state assembly in the 55th district that went from Long Beach up to Carson. And before that, she served in the Long Beach City Council and she served there for either two, two and a half terms, something like that. And before that, she served in the Long Beach School District. So she's had quite a, an illustrious career, uh, always uh, having constituents wanting her to continue to serve in even more important positions. I don't know what happens after state senator, governor, I think, or something like that. <laughs> so uh, Jenny Oropesa, our own uh, state senator. Uh, uh, next to her is... Uh, uh, one of my favorite persons uh, before he became a council member, uh, Bill Rosendahl. He is our council member representing the 11th district here in the city of Los Angeles. His district office is just right down the street um, from Loyola. You go down out uh, Loyola Boulevard and you get to Manchester and right next to the library is where his office is. And oftentimes you'll find him there on Thursdays, I think. Every once in a while, you uh, but find me a lot of times. Though. Yeah, find, and you find him every every time something's going on in Westchester. I always see him uh, running around. Uh, a great great council member. But before that, what was really interesting is that he used to be the uh, the the uh, a senior VP for governmental affairs for uh, at that time Adelphia, and has changed a couple of names uh, and represented ca cable television. But more importantly than that, he ran a public affairs show. That was one of the most important public affairs shows in the city, and I, and I would have to say it's dearly missed because of the lack of civic discussion, and it contributed greatly to it. I, it was called Week in Review, and believe, before that it was called Local Talk. Um, I think we have some great talk, uh, talk, show, talk show hosts here in L.A. on radio, like uh, um, Larry Mantle and Which Way L.A. on, on KCRW. But on television, we're left with uh, KCET's Life and Times, which is okay. It used to be fantastic. I think I still think it's pretty good, but not as good as it used to be. But I think we're missing. Are you saying that because you used to be on it, well, Dr. Okay? Garrett? Ever, right. since I, yeah. ever since I stopped being a, a host for it, they, yeah. yeah. Um, thank you, busted, Senator. Busted, busted. Okay, I know these people all too well here on this panel. 
<laughs> uh, but uh, Bill Rosendahl, a, uh, a man for all seasons, a man for all reasons. He's a, he's a, uh, he was a great, That's nice. great commentator. <laughs> all right. So, uh, Mr. Rosendahl. First, though, I want to start with, with uh, Val Velasco, okay? And we're going to talk about infrastructure. We're going to talk about mobilizing political capital to build infrastructure. And we've been talking in class quite a bit. We've been reading quite a bit about the new environment that exists, not only in Los Angeles, but in many other communities, uh, especially when they are more mature, how the politics change to get things done, okay? We also have, uh, we'll have with us soon, uh, David Fleming, who is chairman of the board of the LA Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Mr. Fleming is, uh, the LA Chamber of Commerce represents all of the important businesses in Los Angeles, and he is Mr. LA. Actually, he's Mr. Valley. He, he's a, a, of counsel to one of the largest uh, LA law firms called Latham and Watkins. Uh, they are housed in the largest building west of the Mississippi, the Library Towers. And he is a very significant individual politically and civically uh, in, in the Valley and in, in uh, Los Angeles. And he's also an appointee to Mayor Villaraigosa on the MTA, the Metropolitan Transportation Authority. And he will be with us in, in a little while. And he, I think, has been, along with the chamber, pushing for greater modernization of LAX, where uh, Ms. Velasco now uh, sits on that board, and also for the port. And I'll have you know that um, uh, Jenny Oropesa, besides being state senator and all that other great things that I talked to uh, about her, she also used to sit on the Metropolitan Transportation Authority, and she's also very concerned with our ports, representing them off and on for the last couple of years, having been a councilwoman in, uh, in Long Beach. Um, there is a sense that it's much more difficult today to get anything done. And part of the reason I brought up the Airbus 380 and, and its landing on Monday was there was some debate as to whether it, it would even come to LA after they had promised because they felt that the airport had not done enough to prepare for the A A380. So what is going on with the airport in terms of, I mean, that, that, it's an ugly airport. <laughs> it's a mess. Well, it, it is. Wait, it, let me ask the students something. How many of you like our LAX airport? <laughs> Ah, come on, raise your hands. It's like convenient. It. Well, it's convenient to <laughs> it's us. It's not but. beautiful. Like number five. Number five. Terminal five. That's Delta. <laughs> well, yeah, a lot of a lot of airports are better than what we have, but we really have a lot of deferred maintenance at our airport, and there are reasons for it. Um, we've been through three mayors now trying to establish a master plan. And the problem that we don't have a master plan is because really Los Angeles World Airport and previous mayors to uh, Mayor Villaraigosa have really pretty much been unresponsive to community concerns, um, residents, and environmental issues that affect those adjacent to the airport, and actually those traveling through the airport. So for 12, about 12 or 15 years ago, I don't even know anymore, I start, I am a resident of Playa del Rey and I see the airport from my backyard. And at, when I moved to that house in 1988, it was 38 million annual passengers per year. And the EIR was uh, authority that for- That means that 38 million different individuals have taken either flights in or out of, or just out of LAX? It's total operations. Total operations. Yeah. 38 million. 38 million coming in and going out. And some of them don't even come into our community. It's just a hub and they get on another plane. Um, and the, e the environmental impact review uh, was authority for 40 million annual passengers. So that's all that the airport was supposed to have, no more than that. And Sometime after I moved there, I started realizing that there were, the planes were going by my house about every six minutes. And at one point I, started, I realized they were going by my house about every three minutes. And I was a, just an individual at that time. I called the executive director who was then Jack Driscoll and said, what's going on at our airport? It seems like capacity's starting to double. And he said, well, why don't you just come in and talk to me? I didn't know him from the man in the moon. And when I got to his office, he rolled out a master plan and said, we're going to get 120 million annual passengers through this airport. What do you think of it? And I laughed. And I said, 
What kind of a neighbor has the airport been? A really bad neighbor, just rolling over the community, not doing anything for our community. Epi, when you bought your house, did you notice that there was an airport there? Oh yeah, I oh, said okay. that. I, I said that. I, I could see it from my backyard. Oh. It was 30 million, 38 million annual passengers then. Uh, when 9-11 came, it was 62 million annual passengers uh, per year, 62 million. From my first meeting with Jack Driscoll, he said, well, how do I get the community on board? I said, well, that's going to be a really good trick, but you need to start calling people into your office and show, lay out the master plan. And from that, I kind of rolled into being a community activist, not really intending to be, but started organizing my neighbors. Um, and there were some small organizations, and then there was one organization that was established, which was called RSAC, the Alliance for Regional Solution to Airport Congestion. I went, to their first, I went to one of their meetings. They already had a board of 38 board members. Imagine trying to get anything done. And when I went to the, it wasn't their first board meeting, it was the first one I attended. They had been in, active for about five months. I said, well, do you have an agenda? What do you expect to do at the meeting? So the next meeting I went to, they elected me president. <laughs> so I became president of RSAC, and I was the president for probably about 12 years and worked in the community, organizing community. We had, at one point, we had about 5,000 members of RSAC. We reached out to Westchester, Playa del Rey, Culver City, all over the city of Los Angeles. Um, we were in a consortium with El Segundo, then Mayor uh, Mike Gordon. We had the support of Maxine Waters, Jane Harmon, against our airport expanding. So we really worked hard to develop our political base. It took a lot of work and a lot of dedication. And you have to be really passionate about an issue if you're going to stick with it, because yeah, you're not getting paid, and it's taking away right. from your family and from your business. Are, are you a NIMBY? I'm not a NIMBY, honey, because I have an airport in my backyard. I already have an airport there. I just want it to be, re I want air travel to be regionalized. I want other people to also share the benefits and the burdens of air travel. Mm -hmm. But w how likely is that? That's it's very likely now. We're developing, developing Ontario Airport. We're going to have okay. United Airlines flying out of Palmdale Airport starting June 7th. To where? To San Francisco. Oh, okay. Yes. Senator uh, Oropesa. I just you, wanted to add a comment on the airport. Can I just add a little? Oh, you can add a lot of comments on the airport. That's what we're having you here for. Okay. So. Just, just on the... Just on the issue of, of the airport and, and, and you got to remember... Is, is she a NIMBY? Well, I wouldn't call her a NIMBY, no. Uh, she's a constituent as well. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, no, I, I wouldn't call her a NIMBY. I think that there does need to be a regional approach. And I'll tell you this, the other statistic that's important to remember is that we don't just have passengers going out of that airport. We also have... Uh, in 2005, we had nearly 2 million tons of air cargo going out of that airport. So this is, this is not just an issue of moving people. It's also part of our economic base relative to cargo. And that's, you know, manufactured goods that are related to the jobs that are part of all of our families, economics. Mm -hmm. And so this, 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 and that's regional. Right. So there is a regional impact in terms so, of whether the, thing, right? it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. It's a good thing for the airport to be able to function, but there's also a critical mass beyond which you get a uh, diminishing return. On, on the productivity of the airport. So when, when Ms. Velasco says, uh, you know, you get to a point where you wanna share it, share the, share the movement with other airports, it makes sense to do that because you, your productivity does not continue to be there and you wanna have some of that product move out of other places like Palmdale and other airports. So there, there's a good argument for it on the, on the, on the, uh, on the cargo side. Mm -hmm. And if we had the infrastructure, which I think we got our friend over here who wants to talk about and probably others, uh, if we could move people easily to the other airports, mm -hmm. I think people would be willing to use those other airports. Yeah, I'm not too sure the about The problem that. is they can't get there on the 405 <laughs> freeway or anywhere else, and that's why well, yeah, they all the want to use LAX. In, uh, in, you're in the transportation committee up in Sacramento, Yes, right? I am. So if you guys have any traffic problems or any alerts, <laughs> send her. He's uh, sending send, them all to me. Yeah. Send her an email. Right. Me, can you talk a little bit about the harbor, though, and the similarities between yes. the harbor and, the, uh, and LAX? 
Well, both of them are very congested, right? And both of them create a lot of uh, air pollutants, which is a very big issue. Um, uh, and uh, in terms of the issue of mobilization and what uh, Valeria was talking about in the topic today of mobilizing political capital for infrastructure, both need additional infrastructure, ports and the airports. Both of them need additional capacity to continue to grow uh, because the demand is there. We have, uh, the ports have a huge, va huge value to us in terms of uh, tonnage that they bring and take out of our, our country, both into our country and out of our country. Uh, the ports of LA and Long Beach combined are the uh, third largest port in the world, in the world. And uh, so they deliver uh, huge amounts of value. Uh, but with that come pollutants and congestion. So the 405 freeway, for instance, and the 110 freeway will experience uh, volumes of congestion and air pollutants that need to be addressed for the um, quality of life uh, in our area that are, well, I'll give you a couple statistics. I'll give you just a couple of statistics. In 2005, the Port of Los Angeles handed, handled uh, 7,485 20-foot uh, equivalent units. Those are those uh, truck tra trailers that you the see containers. on the road. The containers. How many okay. of them? Almost 8,000? Almost 8,000. And the port had 6,700. Uh, 6,700. That's that many trucks, okay? So all of those trucks are polluting on our freeways, and they're creating more traffic on our freeways, all right? So what happens is, in the next 20 years, the projection is that truck travel on the 110 and the 405 will grow substantially, right? There'll be about 3, 35,000 trucks per day operating in those same is that, And that's a good venues. thing. That's, that's, not, that's a good thing for the economics, right? But yeah, not but such all, all a good students, thing for- All my for, students want jobs, though. Yeah, they want jobs, but they don't want to be stuck in the traffic. And they don't want to be sucking the sucking the uh, the fumes either. They don't want to be getting cancer. They don't want to be getting their kids to be getting asthma. Yeah. So these are the policy issues that we got to deal with, and the infrastructure problems. And that's why we have the communities, like around the airport issue that Valeria was talking about. That's why we had the community groups rising up and saying, "Do something about it," and creating the crit the critical mass that. So demands of the legislature figure out an answer. Yeah, but you have to think about it statewide. You can't just That's think about right. people at, at LAX like That's myself right. or Val. You and so we figure out ways, and there are ways. And if you, if you want me to take two seconds to tell you, Can I, I will. Can I ask you in a little while to take two seconds? You, I so will. I, I want to get the councilman So those are, th those are some of the policy and, and other questions that, that we got to deal with. So uh, I got two major questions for you, uh, Councilman. Why did you run for office, and what was your position on the airport and airport expansion? Yeah, first I'm going to give you a certificate, big guy, right, and it man. says to Fernando, the doctor here, in recognition <laughs> and appreciation of your great work for a decade as the founding director of the Thomas and Dorothy Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles and the Urban Lecture Series, your great service to the community of Los Angeles and Loyola Marymount University is truly inspiring. Congratulations on reaching this milestone. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a dollar, folks. I don't take even that. <laughs> Thank you, Congressman. You're welcome. It's a 10-year series here, but I'm going to make an opening statement first. I thought that what we're going to do is talk about a little bit of an opening statement. And here's my opening statement. Get involved in your community, no matter what level uh, of, of involvement it is, but it's your community. When I was your age, I got involved. What did I get involved in? First, the civil rights movement. I live in a little town called Englewood, New Jersey. A quarter of the community was African American, a lot of prejudice, a lot of racism. I went to Washington on all the marches on Washington uh, with Martin Luther King there. And then frankly, when I was in graduate school getting my master's degree at the University of Pittsburgh in social work, uh, Carl Stokes got elected mayor of Cleveland. First African American got elected there. We were involved with the Ford Foundation funding a voter registration drive. And I spent an evening with Dr. Martin Luther 
Luther King hanging with him. I was a 22-year-old kid, and I said, so what makes you do this, and why are you doing that? And little did I know Martin Luther King today is who he is. But he said one big thing, get involved, make a difference, no matter what, because you'll feel good yourself that you're making a difference. That came from Martin Luther King to the kid your age as you guys were. But when I was in college, uh, I then, from the civil rights movement from, from high school, um, was the anti-war Vietnam War. A crazy war and a moral war, a politically stupid war. And I was out there on every picket line I could conceivably be to protest that war. Then, uh, and frankly, uh, I, I went to graduate school and I got drafted. Uh, even though I got accepted into the Peace Corps with my MSW, uh, the Army draft came first. So I went in the Army for two years, okay? Uh, but before I even did that, when I was in the beginning of graduate school, I took a leave of absence and went to work for Bobby Kennedy, who was running for President of the United States. And that activism of this guy, who was a coalition builder, has always been embedded in me from that point on. In fact, I ran a congressional district forum in Indiana, Fort Wayne, and the college kids came down from Fort Wayne uh, and Ann Arbor, and we all bonded. There were 40 of us college kids. We were banging on doors every night, and we won that congressional district. Bobby was so excited because we were supposed to lose it. He invited me to come to Portland, Oregon, where he wanted us to fan out. So I brought all of us kids, 40 of us, to Portland, Oregon, and we fanned out into 180 precincts in that city. And <clears throat> for the last six weeks of that presidential campaign, we were banging on the doors and banging on the doors. And my claim to fame in the Kennedy lore was the day of the election in Oregon, he invited me to come hang with him in his plane a little bit and uh, thank me for what I was doing and all the people involved. He was really a incredibly inspirational guy for me. And he looked at me at the end of this conversation as he's sitting in his plane to go down to LA to campaign for the day and come up to uh, um, uh, Portland that night for the victory party. And he says, uh, so Bill, how am I gonna do today? And I said, Senator, you're gonna lose. And well, he jumped out of his chair. He got 10 foot tall, he got angry. What do you mean I'm gonna lose? And I said, well, my canvas is we're finding out, Senator, that uh, you won't debate McCarthy and this is a state called Government in the Sunshine, and they want to know what you have to hide. Well, I was devastated that I told him he was so angry, but he lost in Oregon. And so I was the kid who told the Kennedy something he didn't want to hear. Well, anyhow, he invited me to LA, and I spent the last week of the campaign uh, with him. Um, and then after the summer in the Kennedy Action Corps, we went around all the places Bobby had gone and energized other young people. Stay involved in the political process. Don't quit it. You can make a difference if you stay involved in it. We all then went to Chicago, and McGovern was our standard bearer at that point as a stand-in for Kennedy. I was there. We were on the floor, and Humphrey got, got the uh, nomination, and the rest on, on that particular story is history. Well, I went back to graduate school, finished my, my master's degree uh, in social work, and got drafted into the Army. And in that experience, uh, again, you, the environment you're in, make the best of it. Try to change things as best you can. Be a change agent and you feel good at least yourself. And with my master's in social work, my first year I was a psychoanalyst seeing eight or nine Vietnam vets a day. Tell you more about war, and we have them walking wounded around here. We've got about 15 thousand homeless people that are veterans uh, within the LA metro area of the 90,000 homeless people. Um, and uh, that impression on me uh, has never left me about the horror of that war. There's other stories about the Army. But I went back um, and worked for George McGovern, who ran for president. And I ran the state of Illinois for him. I set up his finances. I raised him millions, and I traveled with him. Because that was another guy like the other guy who was against the, the Vietnam War. And even though I couldn't end the war, at least I felt good that I was out there trying to make a difference um, with, with the world around me. I can talk a lot more, but that's for a later discussion. Thank you. Well, why did you run for council? What was going on? Well, it's an amazing world. I, I, I was running the local cable company. I was the CEO of first it was Westinghouse Broadcasting and Cable, then it became Century Cable, and then it became Adelphia Cable. And uh, when it was Century, uh, uh, the chairman of the board, which is another bit of advice, grab the brass ring when it comes to you. Don't be afraid to take risks. An offer comes, just go with it. Chairman of the board of, of this uh, conglomerate called Century said, hey, Rosendahl, we got this fallow studio in the building, and we have a distribution wheel uh, in over a million homes in, in the area. It straddles the mountains, and, 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 and it goes from the coast all the way to Eagle Rock. 
Uh, and he said, just do your own thing, because I know you have a passion for the political process. And so, boy, did I take that literally. And I ended up uh, creating 3,000 shows uh, over 16 years, covering absolutely everything one could think of. And the position I was in, I was executive producer, producer, and on-camera talent, so I could basically do whatever I want. I mean, it was my thing. And I used it as an opportunity to connect people to the social and political issues of the day, to empower the public. Empowerment is key. Education is absolutely critical for that empowerment. And I must tell you, this town, when it comes to television, is a wasteland and a disgrace. It's all soundbite journalism. It bleeds if it leads. You learn absolutely nothing. Even with the great schools that teach how to be a good journalist, the stations don't allow the journalists to finish their sentences and finish their thoughts. So I filled a void in a vacuum, and I did that for a bunch of years besides running the place. But running for this office, I got in a fight with the Regases, who turned out to be corrupt and they're out of here and might so be in jail. Did, um, they, did they fire you? Um, well, it, I was laid off. <laughs> <laughs> That's how hey, corporate America deals with hey, you. They I do, lay you I, off. I do want to tell the they, they restructure that, and get that, rid of your position. That right? he mentioned that there are 3,000 shows that he taped and that the Loyola Marymount University is going to take those shows and we're going to archive them and do all kinds of different work for them. So we, we want to be able to announce that, that we've been, we're going to be doing that. So cool. now, I asked you this question like 10 minutes ago. Why did you run for council? <laughs> yeah. The same old frustration that I had when I was a kid. I was fed up with the gridlock that got only worse in this district. Here we have the richest district, the most important influential people, and we have the worst gridlock in the city of Los Angeles. We have north-south gridlock, we have east-west gridlock, we're fried like the frog. The water was there, they turned out the gas a little bit, and before you know it bubbled over. I felt the tipping point <laughs> happening uh, about four or five years ago. What is going on here? Well, I know what's going on. The two, four towns are in this district. Okay, here's my district, from Mulholland Drive in the north down to Imperial on the south and everything west of the 405. So I have places like the Getty and, and Brentwood and the Palisades, West LA, Mar Vista, Del Rey and Palms, Westchester, Playa Vista, Playa Del Rey, uh, and Venice. Okay, it's incredible. But in my district, I have all of Santa Monica. We embrace the entire city. It's in the heart of my district. And we have Culver so you City. But you don't represent Santa Monica. No, they're You're separate towns. Right. Separate towns. Culver City strips right through us along Washington Boulevard. All the shops are theirs. The Costco is theirs. But they get all that revenue. Santa Monica very aggressively said, we want to become the job capital of the West Side in the 80s. So they rezoned areas and encouraged business to come in. Good idea, because the way local governments since Prop 13 function is through sales tax. So they create a lot of jobs. And by creating the jobs, nobody in LA City or the county or even Santa Monica or Culver City for that matter said, well, you create the jobs, I'll create the housing, together we create the transportation infrastructure. Because in LA County, there's 88 towns one is LA with 4 million and then 87 others. And in the region here, there's 18 million people spread out through our eight counties. And nobody's talking to each other or working with each other, but today they are. The incredibleness of the gridlock which got me so frustrated, and one day you I mean, uh, Lincoln Boulevard when you try to get to an eight o'clock. I'm class. telling you, Lincoln and Sepulveda and Barrington and Twenty Third Street. I mean, I can mention every, almost every corner uh, is a disaster. So here was an open seat. It was two thirds Ruth Galanter, who represented two thirds of the district. One third was Cindy Misikowski. In terms of the last election, it was joined together, mm -hmm. and I said, "Wow." Golly, maybe at this point in my life, I was getting near 60. Now and you, and you had been laid too. off. <laughs> I'd been laid off, but I didn't need the job. Uh, I made enough money, I could. He, I did, could. he didn't take my dollar, you saw that. So <laughs> in fact, I take no dollars, no gifts for the councilman. I don't care if it's a box of chocolates or a meal or cookies, I take nothing. Uh, all, for, for, <laughs> <laughs> that, all of that. But, but I decided, why not see at this point in my life if I could make a difference in the government of Los Angeles? That's why I ran. So, and what was your position on the airport when you were running? Oh, was it, was it an issue? It's totally outrageous that you want to fill everybody into this one airport, postage size envelope uh, with houses all around it for 18 million people. There's no metropolitan area in the planet that has one airport for everybody. Right. So I'm now chair of the Southern California Regional Airport Authority. And I'm bringing all eight counties together in 
say, hey, folks, we're all in this mess together. Now, LAX had the lowest landing and takeoff fees of any airport yeah. in America, major airport. That. So the airlines didn't care. They don't care if it took you two hours to get to the gate or three hours to get to the gate. They had a cheap landing and, and, and uh, a takeoff for fees. The fees were low. We've just changed that, thanks to Val Velasco and her commission. Um, they have changed that so the fees will be competitive with Ontario. But the airport was an issue I took on, and I said the word expansion will never be in my mind. Yes, modernization. Yes, um, people mover. You know, yes, greening of all of the infrastructure will make it easier, more efficient. If we want enough gates for the A380 and all this other stuff. But Palmdale, for, for a lot of things eventually, Ontario right now. You know this, that Ontario can handle 12 million passengers right now. It only gets 7 million. Well, who wants to go out of Ontario? I'll tell you why. Because there's oh. millions of people in the Inland Empire and in Ventura and in Orange County that would much rather yep. go to Ontario. But the airlines, they have to offer nonstop, direct, frequent, and discounted flights out of Ontario, just like they do LAX, so that it is incented to the populace around to go to that airport. That's what we're pushing for. Yeah, but they're a business, so they're going to do what makes the most money, right? Ah, so. but we, we're, the, we're the civil servants of the people. We're charging them more landing and takeoff fees, so they're going to begin to look at their book and say, ooh, I met with a guy yesterday that handles all of this um, FedEx type stuff. Mm -hmm. They're moving it majority of it to Ontario. Uh, two weeks before that, Express Air announced 29 nonstop direct flights to 14 different hubs in the southwest out of Ontario. So we are now putting more energy, and all the airlines are going to begin to see that Ontario is a profitable opportunity. Instead of people schlepping from all the way in the Inland Empire to LAX, they would much rather go yeah, there. I so think it will work. I think we ought to double the capacity of the Long Beach Airport. What do you think, State Senator? Or Al Toro. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the issue Thank with the folks. Long Beach Airport is that they're under a court order uh, with a uh, yeah, ceiling expire, on the number though. of with the number of flights. You know, I've always been a supporter of the expansion of the Long Beach Airport, so I think it's something that definitely ought to be in the mix on the regionalization of airport air, airline services. I do. Well, Mr. Fleming, you've been listening to all this very patiently. I introduced you before you got here. You are the uh, uh, president of the LA Chamber. Sure. What is the position of the Chamber on LAX, uh, whether we call it modernization or expansion, and, and the harbor and, and everything that it does? Well, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate coming. I'm sorry I'm late. It was I'm a tra tra traffic. I'm, I'm on the board of I'm on the board of MTA, and I feel your pain. Uh, <laughs> It's always great to be on a panel with my right-wing Republican friend, Bill Rosendahl. Um, <laughs> Bill and I are going to Washington, D.C. Uh, next week uh, with a chamber. We've got 202 people coming, including three mayors, uh, nine council members, uh, the chief of police. And, and Mr. Rosendahl will be flying out of Ontario. It, right. Well, I, I have a flight tomorrow out of LAX, but I think I better cancel it. Anyway, uh, <laughs> there, there's a guy I want you to meet that's coming on this trip, if Good. you haven't met him. His name is Ford Roosevelt. Oh. His grandfather and grandmother were FDR and Eleanor Roosevelt. See, the one who wants to be a... a what was it? Did he want to be a judge? Or something? No, 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 no. He he, he does. He's he's uh, he's the head of Project Grab. Okay, guys, so we can. Uh... <laughs> anyway, okay. I, I just I, I got it. <laughs> I wanted I wanted to call Bill this afternoon, but the line was busy. Anyway, um, let, let me just say this: as far as LEX is concerned, uh, it, it's too small a footprint for a major airport. I mean, and, and when we is, say small. Footprint, we mean the actual physical size. Yeah, yeah. yeah I right, mean, yeah. it's 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 it's, it's you know, it's like Midway in Chicago trying to be O'Hare, and uh, you know, Very we good. feel we feel that th there's got to be a better answer. I mean, I always you know like the Antelope Valley because uh, I brought property out there several years ago. But anyway, <laughs> uh, we we always thought you know 20, 30 years ago that this was going to be the new international airport. Uh, what we have to do is find a way to get in and out of there. Uh, one of the suggestions being made, and don't laugh at it, is putting a tunnel through the mountains from uh, Pasadena on out. You could do that today with the tunneling equipment that we have. We use at MTA. And uh, you, that these, this new equipment out of Europe actually creates 
a new tunnel 65 feet a day and seals it at the same time. So you just, you know, set this thing up and let it go. You could do that, and you could do that, I think, with charging tolls for rail, for, for trucks, and for cars. And you could get, literally, from the basin out there within a period of 20 to 25 minutes. And the other thing is, you know, Mike Antonovich has suggested using that area uh, for where a lot of goods and, and so forth. I think we got to think outside the box. I really do. And I, and I felt for years that LAX is totally outgrown. You know, we've outgrown LAX, I should say. Uh, you mentioned jobs, and you were talking about the port. Most people do not realize that 43% of all waterborne goods that come in the United States come through LA, Long Beach. 43%. For the whole country. For the entire nation. Yeah. We did a study, congressional district by congressional district, as to the tonnage and the dollar amount of the goods on the shelves of every store in their district and the fact that so much of that comes through L.A. Long. We are literally the loading dock for America. Yeah. Now, what does this all mean? It means we have got to develop Alameda East. We have the Alameda Corridor, which is great, but we can't hardly use it because it's like, you know, it's like when you're going to build a railroad, a 100-mile railroad, and you build 60 miles of track, you, don't, you haven't got a railroad yet. We've got to do Alameda East. We've got to spend approximately $11 billion just here in L.A. County and in Riverside and San Bernardino County to do the job that we need done to get these goods from a port which would run 24-7 yeah. out Meaning through the Inland Empire. When you say 24-7, it's not running that right now? No, no, no. Out through the Inland Empire, up north, to get it out of this area. Now, it's true, a lot of those goods stay in this area, but a lot of them get out of California. We have got to do that, and this is really a national problem because we are literally the loading dock for America. We are the third largest seaport in the world and growing constantly. With our traffic with the Far East, it's gotten enormous. And if you talk about jobs, if we spent this kind of money, we could create between a half a million and a million logistical jobs right here in Southern California. And those are jobs that pay higher than manufacturing with all the benefits. We're talking jobs that pay in the area of forty-five to 50000 a year and up. And you don't need a college education to, to, to fill a job like that. So, you know, all in all, this could be a win-win situation. But one of the jobs that we have to do in Washington, and Will, Bill, and Bill's going to help us, I know that, is convince the United States government that they have a major role in this, not just from the standpoint of helping us out, they have a major role when it comes to homeland security, when it comes to everything else in this country. Because if we get clogged up, America stops. And that's important to get across. The other thing is, they are literally collecting millions and hundreds of millions of dollars every year in customs. And this custom revenue just goes into the general fund of the oh, United yes, States right. government. None of it comes to us because we're the ones that are really paying the price because of the congestion that we have on our roads. So are, are you a NIMBY? Uh, I'm only a California NIMBY. Uh, I think it's time that we realize, you know, who's paying the price to import all these goods in the United States, and it's just going to go up. Let me get Bill and then Just one Senator. quick comment on, on a footnote on what he just said. We donate $50 billion more to Washington in taxes than we get back. Fifty billion. These little pork barrel states, you know, they have two senators. We have two senators for 36 million, which is to me not too cool. Uh, and so we don't get our fair share of our tax dollar. And when you look at Southern California, which is the absolute vibrating center of the earth, I mean, it's 18 million people from every place on the planet in large numbers. Uh, it's an incredible, um, uh, productive 
piece of the earth. I mean, from the port at 43%, we're told it's going to go to 63%, uh, to the airports in the region and all the businesses we do, and we get $50 billion less. So one of the main things that we all go back there for is get more of our fair share of our dollars. Yeah. And I say to you, when these presidential candidates come to kiss and, and play with you and get your support, Democrats and Republicans alike, look at them in the eye and say, what are you going to do for our transportation infrastructure? Because we need billions from Washington to really help us on that. What are you going to do to help Southern California continue to be vibrant? These candidates have never come here for anything but money until now. Now, New York has moved its primary to February, and so has LA. So the two big California. anchor states are going to fight it out. Senator Oropesa, you, in this July, you're going to vote for a budget that's over $100 billion. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of money at the state level as well. Right. Well, there is money at the state level. And actually, what I was hoping we would get to is some solutions, because uh, in response to uh, the concerns and the challenges and the frustration that you're hearing up here and that I know all you have uh, about driving in the congestion, uh, and the thing, uh, th there are solutions, and the voters have voted for a solution right. in California. And I, I think this discussion has to include that solution, and that's the bond issue that everybody voted for, for in infrastructure last November. Last November, the voters of California went to the polls and voted for a $50 billion bond issue. The voter, and which is the largest bond issue that uh, for infrastructure that has ever been approved in the state of California's history, and they said yes, we want to invest in infrastructure in this state. And so what what we're looking at now is 40 billion dollars for non-education related infrastructure, and that's big. Mm -hmm. That is never since the days of. Uh, uh, the Pat early Brown. days of Pat Brown in the early 60s, have we seen that kind of investment? So what are we doing with it? What are we doing with it? Right now, we have a program for a plan, which is being debated in many pieces in the legislature right now, for spending half of that money, for going out to the market and the issuance of bonds for half of that money, 20 billion of it. And that half would include money for a whole lot of different programs, uh, everything from uh, dedicated funds for local streets and road improvements <coughs> under existing programs uh, to uh, specified funds for improving Route 99, which is, goes through the Central Valley, to specifically money for what we've been talking about now, which is the goods movement in the ports, mm -hmm. to money for um, school bus retrofitting, which goes to air quality. And that's something I want to spend just a couple minutes talking about, because it's a thing that we haven't talked a lot about here, but I think is very important in this dialogue, because not only are we talking about congestion relief, but we're talking about, when you talk about quality of life, how about the health the continued health of residents, as well as their moving along in their cars. How about not getting cancer? How about not having asthma? How about living a few more years? You know, to my way of thinking, and I am pushing this agenda hard and heavy as a as one of a few members of the legislature who's viewed as a transportation expert, that there is a direct nexus and ought to be in our funding of transportation at the, at the state level, and I think at every level, between transportation dollars and improve, cleaning up our air dollars. That for a dollar spent for transportation, I believe there ought to be a dollar spent for cleaning up our air. Until we get it right, until we get closer to, you know, some kind of clean air standard that is rash air, uh, there ought to be that kind of commitment. And right now, in this plan, we've got a lot of that. We've got lots of dollars for air quality cleanup. And I'm, I'm pleased to say that the, that the chair of the Transportation Committee in the Senate views it that way. And we think that in some of the legislation that's required for implementing a lot of these bond dollars, that's going to be one of the criteria that is set that will trickle down to MTA, to the California Transportation 
Commission. Those are some of the bodies that will be, you know, implementing the program dollars, that that will be one of the criteria for allocation of these funds, programming these funds. How much bang do we get for our buck in, in congestion management, uh, in relieving congestion, and what are you doing for air quality? How are you cleaning up the air, and how are you improving congestion? That's what we want this $20 billion to go for. And that's going to be real on the ground, Joe. Mr. Fleming, what do you think about that tying uh, air quality criteria to transportation dollars? Well, there's no question about it. Let me just talk about the $20 billion. The $20 billion is only a down payment. Mm -hmm. We need well over $100 billion. You're right. Billion. You do sound like a we liberal. Need, we need, nope. well, no, no, no. We need well over $100 billion just to begin to solve our transportation problem. I sat on the California Transportation Commission for Absolutely. years that we didn't have any money. And now we do. So this $20 billion, which everybody is trying to grab off the table, it's like having, it's like having three full meals out there at a table at the downer party. I mean, that these, <laughs> the, these, everybody's trying to get, and it's anybody but L.A., right? You know, that's, 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 true. that's, that's, that's the way it is. Yeah, that's true. So, yeah, but we have the greatest representation up there. Well, we have great people up there. There's no question about it. But we need, we need more ours. numbers. That's why we're going to get ours. <laughs> but the point of it is, look. This, this bond issue of 40-some billion dollars or 38 or whatever it was. 40 billion. You know, when you look at what Pat Brown did in 1960, he built the peripheral canal, he built the freeway system, or started the freeway system for the whole state. We only built about 60% of what we needed. He did higher education. The UC system, Cal State. And you know, the money that was spent then was a far greater share of the GNP at that time than this bond issue or even $150 billion would be today. So when you, when you look at it in perspective of that nature, we've got a long way to go and we're gonna have to have more bond issues passed by the people. And the great thing about it is that if it passes, it's gotta pass in LA County because we're 28, 30, 31% of the whole vote of the state we're the ones that, in effect, put the money in the ATM machine. And Bill talked about the ATM machine that we are as far as Washington is concerned. We finally got to get it through to people that are running for the presidency of the United States. That what, if they want to come out here and, 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 and pick our pockets for campaign expenditures, we got to get a quid pro quo. That's we got to get our fair share back from Washington, D.C. And that's got to be a promise and a promise that's kept. Well, the one, do, one thing, ahead. I just have to say a real quick phrase about that. We may need $100 billion, but I am not willing to go back to the voters and ask for another red cent until we prove that we know how to spend the money right. So my job as a senator is to make sure that we spend that $40 billion honestly, straightforwardly, and well, and deliver good projects at a good price, and, uh, and do them well, and then, when we've done at least 20, then I'm willing to say, voters, do you think it's a good idea to do some more? And then I think they'll say yes. That's the way I feel about it. May I say something? I'd like I really to say do. something about political accountability. Senator Odepesa is talking about, Councilman Rosendahl is talking about, we had Mayor Hahn, who at, at the beginning of his, his campaign signed a pledge that said he pledged not to expand LAX political accountability. It was the first time Antonio Villaraigosa ran for mayor also. He signed the pledge and said, I won't expand LAX. Guess what happened when he did during his first four years? He, Steve Sobroff, when he, you ran for mayor, you signed that pledge also. Um, he, I just wanted to let the students know that Steve Sobroff is here, president of Playa Vista, and also the, the, the most important title, he is chair of the advisory board to the Center for the Study of Los Angeles. Steve. Um, so Mayor Hahn signed the pledge not to expand LAX, and he promoted an airport expansion plan during his first and only term to expand LAX. The voters came back to him and knocked him out of office. That was one reason, and he made, that was not just because of the airport. There were other pledges that he made that he did not live up to, but the voters remembered. Yeah, but shouldn't elected officials have the flexibility if they learn more issues or are informed or something happens that they ought to be able to change their promises? Are we going to lock them into? 
they can change their their well they can change the way they handle things but if they make a commitment they, there's other ways of dealing with things he could have said well we can reach a middle ground on this we can bring our airport to maybe 80 percent 80 million annual passengers which we're going to do 78.9 million but we also can reach a middle ground in taking into consideration the environmental factors and the nexus between the pollutants that come out of that development and how it affects all the people that live around and the people that come to the airport. He wasn't willing to take that position. Okay, I'm going to do a couple of things here. Number one, I'm going to ask, we're going to take a little sidebar and ask Mr. Fleming about the living wage since he was involved with it and we've talked about it before. And then right after that, we're going to ask. If he talks about it, I'm going to talk well, about it. Well, that's what I was just going to say. No, but, but, then, but then we're going to have council member Rosendahl take an objective perspective and he's going to ask questions of the panel like he used to in the days before when he was a host. So I'm going to turn over the moderator position to the council member right after that. And after he's all done and we'll see, he'll ask only, only one question, okay, for each panelist. And then after that I'm going to have um, Val Velasco ask the uh, council member a question as a constituent that has not, nothing to do with the airport, <laughs> okay? So, Mr. Fleming, we have talked quite a bit about uh, living wage in, in my class um, and some of the other classes. You were in the middle of the whole debate. You were negotiating. You were inside with. The, you were talking to the mayor, to the um, uh, to, and negotiating on behalf of the hotels and on behalf of the chamber. Give the students a little bit of context and then how, how that played out. And then we'll have uh, uh, Councilman Rosendahl give a quick comment before he asks those questions. The operative word meaning quick. So Bill's going to ask me questions. This is pretty good vodka, incidentally. Um, well, let me talk about it. First of all, I'm in favor of everybody making as much money on their job as they possibly can. You know, I don't have anything against the living wage. What I do have is I think it's untoward for once we have a minimum wage in California, for the city of Los Angeles to impose a living wage above the minimum wage for the state, and I'll tell you why. It puts LA in a very disadvantage, a great disadvantage as far as competing with other cities. We've lost a lot of business to other cities in this county. Um, it takes forever to get things done in the city of Los Angeles uh, when you go through the bureaucracy, and there's so many things you have to do. You, you gotta go to eight different departments to plant a tree for crying out loud. And, and so consequently, what I'm saying is this. I think that wages should be left up to the negotiation between labor and management. We have a California living wage, which is higher, incidentally, than the wage throughout the United States. But once you start picking industries and say, you're going to have to pay a living wage because people go through LAX to come to your place, you might as well say, People drive city streets to get to your place of business, therefore they, they have to use silly city facilities, therefore you're under our aegis and we're going to determine how much you pay. Now having said that, you know, I'm in favor of these workers getting everything they can uh, and, you know, I certainly feel that they have a right to collective bargaining. I don't have any problem with that. It's, it's been that way in America for years and it seems to work. I just think it's not the position of a city government to determine what a business in that city has to pay its private workforce when it's on private property. Now, Council Member Rosendahl and Councilwoman Janice Hahn were the two main proponents of this who were really and, pushing and, it. And, and President, Council President Garcetti, yeah. And Council, yeah. Uh, Councilman Rosendahl, why should the, the uh, city intervene in the uh, affairs between management and workers? Because in our system, we just uh, cut a deal with the business community for the Grand Avenue projects where they will get, uh, by not paying certain taxes, a, a subsidy of $66 million. When we help corporate America, it's considered good business. Yeah, but that's downtown. These I'm just those, explaining oh, okay. how when we meddle. When you meddle for the business community and give them that kind of support, that's good partnering. But when you meddle for the workers, it's keep your nose out of our business. So just you understand the difference. You can give them money when, it's, when it works for them, but not when it doesn't. But let me tell you about this particular place. We're talking about $9.39 with health benefits 
or $10.64 without it. For a group of 3,500 workers in 12 hotels along Century Boulevard. Now, we're spending three to four billion dollars in retooling the infrastructure of that airport. I, as chair of public works, wants to create a, a zone there that then also creates a conference center so that these hotels become a destination point, not just a fly-through point. These hotels have the highest occupancy rate in the city. People go to those hotels. These workers should get a living wage instead of holding a second job and a third job and so on and so forth. One guy came in, bought one of the hotels, Four, Sto Four Point Sheridan, <clears throat> and he immediately gave everybody the living wage, and those who were making that already, he gave them a 10% increase. Why? And I'm a businessman. I had 2,700 employees, okay? If you treat your workers right, they even become more productive and set up a better climate. This would not break the bank of any one of these <clears throat> hotels if they gave their workers a living wage. We're living in a society where the rich are becoming super rich. I mean, we give tax cuts to billionaires when we shouldn't be giving them tax cuts, and yet we have this paltry minimum wage as a nation that never even kept up with the cost of inflation. So the gap between the have-nots and the haves is getting greater and greater every day. We're losing our middle class into working class. You want to become a third world country? Great. I don't. And I think to have a strong middle class <laughs> is important. And this would not hurt anybody. But they didn't like us meddling. And God bless everybody on this. I think it should have stayed on the ballot because over 70% of the people would have voted yes for this kind of a wage. That's it. Thank you. Okay, and, and, and Bill, I, you know, a few years ago, the council passed an ordinance that said if you do business with the city, you have to pay a living wage. We didn't have any objection to that because it's voluntary. You either want to do business with the city, and that's one of the conditions, or you don't. That's fine. It's the point that you're making businesses in the city pay more than businesses outside the city, and. And I, I, I just so all I, the hotels in El Segundo don't have to do that, but well, the ones down Century Boulevard that's do. That's true. And 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 incidentally, those hotels, their their rates that they get are lower than almost anybody else. I mean, airlines come in and they negotiate a fifty dollar a night rate, which is far below what what you would get in other hotels. But be that as it may, I just think that this is an issue that's voluntary that ought to be left between labor and okay. management. I'm going to turn the mic over to Councilman Rosendahl. He's going to ask a couple of questions, and then we're going to have the students ask some questions of the council member and the, and the rest of the panel. And don't forget, Val, you're going to ask them a question about I constituent think, service. I, or I have it? a good constituent yeah, you, I have to leave a quarter to seven, just so no, we, you know. We, I have two we, other we, events we, to go to. You're well, first, already late. If this is my <laughs> moment, I want to say welcome to LMU University, folks, and all of you watching Channel 35 out there through the great city, welcome to this informative discussion in LMU on social issues. Thank you so much. Okay, um, I'll start with Val. Val, tell us the leadership role that RSAC has played in the political uh, dynamism of this city. Well, the leadership role really was to organize the community and to organize residents and to act in conjunction with politicians, to uh, work with politicians, to let our politicians know what our position was about the airport and our concerns, and to hold those politicians accountable. Uh, and the reason we supported Councilman Rosendahl, because he early in his campaign said, I'm for regionalism. I'm for making the airport not expand in north into Westchester Playa del Rey. He took that position early on and we trusted him and he has remained committed to that position. The same thing for Mayor Villaraigosa. And actually the first time he ran, he was the first one to sign the RSAC pledge that says I pledge not to expand the airport. And I just have to say this, that Dr. Guerra probably 10 years ago said to me, Valeria, give it up. You are never going to be able to fight the airport. You might as well give up now because they're going to roll right over our community the way they did in the 70s. And I'm here to tell you, we have held that $150 million the airport has spent to try to expand, and grassroots has won out, at least kept the airport from expanding so far because we worked hard 
and we worked with our politicians who have been responsive yeah, to us. That's before I had tenure. <laughs> <laughs> and how does that make a change? Well, I'm here to tell you that I'm willing to bet um, that the airport will go over 80 million uh, passengers per year in, in the foreseeable future. Um, well, we I'll have, take you a know, wager we, on that. How I much do you want to bet? A dollar. You and, got a buck. And, 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 and another proclamation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Done deal. If you got a flight on Tuesday, you better leave on Monday. <laughs> You know, and real quickly for those of you who don't know, RSAC was the first plaintiff in a lawsuit, an environmental uh, lawsuit filed against the airport, which the, the county of Los Angeles joined Culver City, Inglewood, and El Segundo. Um, and out of that came a settlement agreement. So, and part of the settlement says there, it's going to be constrained to 78.9 until the year 2020 at least. So, uh -huh. right. you just lost your dollar. No, I'm, 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 there's no way. <laughs> Uh, to David, um, yeah. uh, Prop 13, you know, took away a revenue stream that right. had a lot to do with social services throughout right. it. Right. I was chair of the Commission on Taxing Policy for the New Economy and had 17 hearings up and down the state, and I had Republicans and Democrats and everybody in between. And everybody basically agreed that the sales tax system is unfair because the small towns take advantage of it and the big city loses out. How can we help the city of Los Angeles have a more robust budget so that it can provide the services that it can't provide right now. More police, it'll take 83 years to do all this, the, right. the sidewalks on the list and all these other things. Bill, you're absolutely right. I, I think Prop 13 was a self-inflicted wound, and I think the reason is is because people in Sacramento got to the point where they say, well, we'll just spend this and spend that, and you know, if the money's always there because the price of real estate goes up. And people were really afraid of losing their homes, so you can understand why Jarvis and, you know, was successful. But be that as it may, I think we've got to restructure the whole taxing structure of the state. I mean, it, it makes no sense at all for you know, the state government to be able to take the good dollars, the ones they can always count on, namely, you know, the real estate taxes, and then stick the cities with the sales tax. I just think it's totally unfair. I think there's got to be some kind of a balance because you're right. You know, every time you turn around, zoning is for a big box store. And what we need is we need more manufacturing. Mm -hmm. We need a lot of things that don't provide the cities that kind of tax revenue, but provide the state. And there's no incentive on the part of the city to do this. So, so are, I think are you, I think are you really a Republican? Need. Well, I'm I'm kind of in the middle of the road. I so mean, you're kind I, of like you know, I'm between the two yellow stripes. So you're like uh, Schwarzenegger <laughs> and Steve Sober off kind of the kind of that way. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, All right. I'd love to have a conversation with you about that because I'm chair of revenue and taxation. So I'm. I'm open to ideas from see, anybody. See, aren't you that. glad you came tonight? I mean, you know, we just solved that problem. I would problem. love <laughs> to hear ideas about that. I really would. Yeah. I really, really would. So my question to you, Senator, is uh, I endorsed you in your campaign, and I'm very happy you won. And, and a lot of my progressive friends in this area and Republicans supported you because they believe in your kind of leadership. Would you explain for you right now the difference between your experiences in the assembly where you were, and now a senator, and, and how you feel your effectiveness grows with this new position? Oh, that's a great question. Well, the difference- Hey, I would have asked the same question had I been, <laughs> <laughs> had you been given the chance. Yeah. But you're not David Letterman <laughs> over here. No competition in this room. <laughs> I'm not gonna say anything. <laughs> uh, well, I think one of the biggest differences between the two houses is that the Senate is half as large. And so there is an opportunity, and, and the terms are twice as long. So uh, on the first score, uh, you have a smaller number of people that you are working with. You have the opportunity to have personal conversations with your colleagues, uh, with a greater number of your colleagues on a regular basis. Uh, it's much closer to a local government experience because you can have a, a real dialogue with lots of, uh, lots of the votes that you need to pass something. Mm -hmm. uh, in the assembly, there are 80 members of the assembly. So to have a personal dialogue with all of them is very difficult. Mm -hmm. With 40, you can talk with and meet with many of them mm -hmm. in a reasonable time frame. Uh, and that's very different, and it's better. Uh, 
the second, uh, on the second score, uh, I think that uh, having four years versus two years gives you the, the opportunity to uh, not always be, uh, and I've heard this from many, many uh, members of the Senate, that it gives them the luxury of having a longer time frame to work on issues. Uh, when you are worrying that you may not be around for more than two years, mm -hmm. you have a shorter time frame in which to work on your legislation. Uh, I can think about uh, working on a bill over a longer period of time, knowing that I have four years to work on a policy issue. And so that is a great difference because some of the complexities like Working on the tax system, I have yeah. uh, you know I have a four-year period in which to really process and think about and work on an, a, a real big complex issue. And um, but working for city council, we always said that there is one issue that always gets you reelected, and I think Kenny Hahn was actually famous for this too as a supervisor. And that one issue is fixing potholes. So we, I noticed we have a lot of potholes in the district and the street I live on really is really bad. It hasn't been resurfaced for probably 20 years. So what can you do about the potholes well, there, in our there, district? There, there's two things. First of all, the city has deferred infrastructure maintenance and ongoing expenditures. 83 years to do all the broken sidewalks that are officially on the government list to be repaired. Tree trimmings, nine to 11. <clears throat> we do have a 311 number for potholes. There are people there who answer the phone and they will fix a pothole if it's explained that this is a hazard for the automobile and for safety issues. Anything on safety <clears throat> will get over everything else on the list. But my proposal is going to be for the November 08 ballot, a billion dollar plus bond measure for infrastructure within the city. I want to get buy-in from all 15 districts, all the neighborhood councils, all the chambers and everybody else to identify what the most significant infrastructure need is, work that into the bond measure because I'm told that if we get a bond measure passed, we can over the 10 year period absolutely fix the city, which must be fixed. The infrastructure has been always getting worse rather than better. It's the same thing in the federal level. They don't spend enough money on infrastructure throughout this great nation. You know, they spend it on a war that obviously makes no sense to the kid here, uh, billions of dollars, and yet they should be spending that on infrastructure. So we in the city are going to hopefully bite the bullet and let the voters decide if they want to do that. And that will really have a major impact. Thank okay. you. Thank you. We have about uh, 20 minutes with a council member and about 30 minutes with the rest of the panelists. So uh, any questions, comments? Uh, let's start right here. Nicole? Uh, you were just talking about the district and how close you are the government. We're passing you a mic so we can uh, hear, mo more importantly than anything else, record it. Go ahead, Nicole. Um, you were talking about kind of like outsourcing people and goods to other um, airports throughout the county. And I heard you guys mention a lot about Palmdale and Ontario, but what about airports like Van Nuys and Burbank? Because I live in the Valley, and I know you, know you have the main subway that's running right through North Hollywood, and then the Orange Line that goes like straight through the Valley. Right. Are those two airports that you're kind of focusing on? Because I feel like they're kind of important. Sure, they're not in our there, district. Go ahead. There aren't any commercial flights at Van Nuys Airport. It's a general aviation airport. And Burbank, we don't have jurisdiction over, although through SCRAW, we'll, we hope to establish... Through, through what's it called? Southern, Southern California Southern. Regional Transportation so Authority. Yeah. Um, and so um, we hope to establish, um, you know, work with Burbank so that we, they can accept more, but I think they're pretty limited in their flight. Mr. Well, Fleming? they are. It's a, it's a very small footprint, and you stay, have the same problem around Burbank Airport you do around LAX. Namely, it's in a huge urban, tight urban area. Uh, I was really unhappy about the fact that the government allowed uh, uh, the airport, uh, the, the, the military airport in Orange County, uh, to El Toro. Uh, yeah, El Toro. I think it, you know, that would have been a natural. It was already an airport for heaven's sakes. And uh, to there was a lot of neighbors away. who could see the airport from their backyard who didn't want it there. Yeah, but those, those are true NIMBYs because they don't have an airport oh. in their backyard already. Yeah, right. So Okay. But in, in San Diego, I was, got a I was just making an observation. <laughs> but you know, I, I really think that eventually Palmdale will be the answer. I mean, you could build a runway out there 12 miles long. I mean, it's like Edwards Air Force Base. I mean, it's just incredible out there. It's clear 360 days a year, 
All we have to do is get people there. The problem has always been with LAX is getting it in and out. And it just, it can't grow much bigger than it is. Senator? I do think there may be some room for some additional flights, some additional flights. If we're looking at a regional approach, just as Long Beach might take some additional flights, there could be some, I mean, it's on the margins though, as, as was said, it's not a big, it's not a big airport. It's not gonna be a big airport. Burbank. Okay. Let's go it's right, right here. Then, 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 yeah. yeah, it's then not gonna be then, a big then, Go ahead and pass the mic. Right. Keep going, keep going. You know, while the mic's being passed, there's one thing that, that really concerns me, and, and I, maybe the rest of the panel wants to comment on it. The last city election had a turnout of a little over 7%. That's, that's not a democracy, folks. I mean, you know, I have said for a long time, this be, may be a little heretical, but I've said for a long time that I think city elections should be at the same time as general elections, where you can get a turnout of 40, 50% city elections other than a race for mayor is just yeah. really we actually and had with a seven percent turnout i wouldn't call this a representative democracy anymore it's just yeah i mean terrible. we i would love to get the response from the panel but we actually had a whole panel on that this oh, you last did? Yeah, yeah talking well, there about was no sorry election. i was late i was, was caught no in traffic election. i'm sorry five no. of the incumbents had no opponents even on the ballot i mean yeah. come on Okay. Since we don't have clean money and they taking money out of it. It. Oh. <laughs> it it's dysfunctional. It's broken. Uh, yeah, I noticed that there was uh, some kind of oblique mentioning of uh, security infrastructure uh, when people were talking about the Long Beach port. Um, and I know that that's a really huge issue, especially with, you know, loose nuclear material. And we're not just talking about like a fission or a fusion accident or something. There's stuff like putting cesium around a few hundred pounds of C4 uh, that could cause uh, a problem in the Long Beach port uh, that would literally take out 43% of the nation's uh, goods and stuff like that. I also know that this is under the federal government's purview, but I know that the number of ports that are, or port containers that are being ins inspected is still in the single digits. It's That's right. really, really tiny. So I'm wondering if there are um, things that y'all are doing or uh, can do within your purview, uh, other than requesting the government to uh, sort of do, the federal government to sort of do a little bit better on this because they haven't been for several years. Uh, and what those things are. Yeah, Senator, what yeah. are you doing? <laughs> well, we are, we, the bond, the bond that was passed uh, and this round of the allocations does include $100 million for port security. It's a drop in the bucket, uh, but it does, it is, it is, uh, if nothing else, it's $100 million plus the symbolic statement that the state has a role to finance this. Uh, in part, along with the federal government. So that's an, it's an acknowledgement. Sometimes that's as important as the dollars at the beginning, you know, uh, that there is, it's important for us to finance, to be a partner in financing uh, uh, security. Uh, the other part of it, though, is uh, that we really do have to, as a state, and this is a bipartisan effort, that is taking place now to advocate in Washington, D.C. for fairness in the allocation of homeland security dollars. What occurred in the first round of homeland security dollars is that it was allocated on a on a just a formula basis to the states. And so all states, regardless of their risk, were allocated dollars. That means that a state like well, not to pick on Wyoming, but or Montana, but they received uh, basically a proportional share vis-a-vis -vis their, you know, their state to California, uh, even though we have this huge port operation and we're a much more vulnerable state. What we're looking at this round uh, is advocating for allocation based on need. We're going hand in hand with the governor, the legislature, the governor, the private sector, local government, everybody, uh, to advocate for homeland security dollars based on risk. So I know the governor has been back in Washington advocating. The state assembly was back uh, in D.C. this week 
Um, the Senate is going, and I'll be part of that de delegation that's going the last week of April. Uh, and, one, and I think one of our top, top priorities is to advocate on this issue because it is expensive. We do need uh, federal, federal support, and it's, uh, it really is a matter of homeland security and something that we cannot ignore. And our airports are also part of the equation, pardon me, on this. It's not just a port issue, it's also an airport issue, and it's very, very, very serious and very important. Daniel? You guys seem really cool with um, throwing all the problems of LAX into other places such as Palmdale and Ontario. And I just wanted to know, um, last time I checked, Ontario and Palmdale weren't destinations. So when cargo lands or when people land, they're probably going to be traveling around LA County and Ontario County, things like that. There's like one freeway that goes to Palmdale. There's like two that goes to Ontario. I already hate driving in the traffic on the 10 and the 60. So how can you just, and I mean, that's just going to add more congestion and worsen air quality out there. So why is it that Los Angeles is more special, such as Westchester? Why is Westchester more special than places like Ontario and Palmdale? Yeah, he's, a, he, he's a NIMBY from Ontario. If you live in the Inland Empire, if you live in Ontario, or you live in Claremont or Pomona, it's much easier for you to take a flight from Ontario. Same for Palm Springs, anywhere coming in. If you try to, even from Orange County, coming north to Ontario, it takes less time to get from, say, Huntington Beach to Ontario than it does to LAX during rush hour. And so it's a definite advantage that. And LA is a destination, but we're also doing really spending a lot of dollars on public relations and that airport is and they're both called LA Ontario LA Palmdale so that people understand they can get to Los Angeles County by going to those airports you know we have our that LAX is 3600 acres it is the th that's small it, it's very small Palmdale 17,000 acres well that's a desert though it's like nobody lives there well, well that's even better <laughs> yeah. but let me just tell you LAX is the third busiest airport in the world and the fifth smallest in the world geographically. So we are really congested at this airport and we really need to do something so about it. It's very when, dangerous. It's very yeah. dangerous. So, it's very dangerous. Well. Senator, when your mother's coming to visit you, do you want her to land at Palmdale or at LAX? Actually, I'd prefer, uh, depending on the it's time of day, question, that she'd land in Orange County oh. uh, <laughs> or, or some, you know, really, I mean, there, in Long Beach, it depends on the time of day. I live in Long Beach, and it depends on the time of day. It actually may be better for me to schlep to Orange County, to be honest. I mean, mm -hmm. it really is the traffic access. It has to do with how fast you can get there, right? Let and me so go right over there, then right there. I, I, might, I might just add, you know, Heathrow is a great example of a where airport that works because you can get on a Heathrow Express and you're downtown in 15 minutes. That's what we have to do with uh, Palmdale. The infrastructure. Yeah. And Fernando, it's the transportation infrastructure between the airports, and we're talking about Santa Barbara to San Diego. We're talking about a region, not just one county. Right. And, and much right. peop people would love to get on a light rail. A mile and a half from LAX is the green line. I want it into the airport, and I'm fighting for that mile and a half. My God. She and I are fighting real hard. We're part of a coalition on this side of town that says the green line, a mile and a half from LAX, should go into LAX now. It can hook into the whole transportation grid right now. We could have two stops, uh, one on uh, Century and Aviation, another one in Parking Lot C. All the people working at the airport can take that light rail to it, even passengers can get off of a plane and get in a train, and eventually, when the mayor's uh, red line to the sea, the expo line to Santa Monica, and the, the Crenshaw line happens, as these lines happen, we will have a transportation infrastructure that will relieve the congestion. But right now, it's a disaster, and it's going to get worse before it gets better. Okay. Back here. Go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, I was actually just going to say that the difference between London and here is they have a public transportation right. system. Um, and, and they speak English. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm from. Um, all right. And my question. I thought I was moderate. See, see. My, my question was actually um, to set aside the. I don't want to say fantasy of changing our entire infrastructure right now. That's kind of a lofty plan. Um, looking at the traffic that we are dealing yeah. with right now and, and looking at what you were talking about with the, the trucks and the 18 wheelers and, and that issue, yeah. you know, I, I don't really understand why uh, we haven't been kind of addressing 
just solutions that I think are dealable solutions, that are attainable solutions, they might be kind of scratching the surface, mm -hmm. but why aren't we looking at regulating the times trucks can drive on our streets? Why can't businesses be dealing with why 18-wheelers? Why am I driving at 4 o'clock in the afternoon and sandwiched by four 18-wheelers? Why aren't they do dealing with their business at 3 o'clock in the morning? You know, and I understand that that would change the entire way that um, business is done in this city, um, and so it should. Yeah, that sounds good. That's, That's good. Are well, you a transportation planner? <laughs> no, I'm just a thinker. I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> you know, one of the challenge that is a very good question and an interesting suggestion, and the the issue uh, we are trying to move toward, uh, as was mentioned earlier by Mr. Fleming or somebody, 24-7 yeah. operation at our facilities that pick up those loads on the trucks at the ports. Um, and, and if we could do that, I believe that a lot of the trucks would operate in the middle of the night because it would just be so much more efficient for the truck operations because they would have no traffic and they could move so much more quickly. Yeah, but, you know, but we do have the problem that the ports right now are not operating 24-7. Now, you would hear... Why is that? Okay, there's the question. Why is that? And you will hear, you will hear the reason why... Uh, is because the workers won't work at that hour, and the answer is that they will not work at that hour for what they are the, the their employers are willing to pay them. So there needs to be an agreement that is come to between employer and employee on a price that is agreed to where that can happen. Don't those guys and get paid 100,000 already? And when that happens, it is a push-pull, and when the market drives it to the point, to when it becomes more, it's either gotta be compelled by the marketplace or compelled by some other forces. Well, and that's the well, question well, well, that you're out. pushing. Time out here. That's the point that you're pushing. You're saying, let us push it for them. You're saying, let us push it for them, all right? Yeah. And then, okay, and so then that is a policy decision that has to be made, all right? That's a, that is the question. Should we push it for them? Has it become so bad? And this is the thing that we decision makers have to draw the line on all the time. Mm -hmm. The line is, and Mr. Fleming probably comes down at a different point than I do some of the time, and some of the time I might be where he is, okay? That's the difference between uh, a liberal and a conservative, all right? It's where you, and, and all the shades in between. This is the politics, this is the political, Spectrum, all right, and I'm somewhere in there. I'm not all the way on the left. I'm not all the way on the right I'm somewhere in there my politics and so the question is all right Are we at that crisis point where it's time to step in and say all right? Y'all aren't doing it on your own and we have reached crisis point So we are going to compel it. So this because is a question to, is, to so that is the question Rosendahl. This is I mean, the question. Yeah, he's got the power along with the rest of the council. That's the You're question. willing to compel hotels to pay a living wage. You're willing to compel airlines and the airport to do what you want them to do. Why don't you compel these workers to work or the companies to work at the harbor? And I mean, tomorrow you would solve a large problem of that. And I think that's a high, as high a degree as- I, I might say my colleague Janice Hahn agrees. And she well, is there's two votes, okay. the chair of the committee that I'm a member of. I'm, in, I'm vice chair, which handles the airport and the harbor. And we strongly agree, but it isn't just us yeah. because it's the entire route and the state. And so the state has to be involved. The counties have to be involved, the cities That's and true. the federal government to actually regulate some of these things. That's so true. at the harbor, you couldn't uh, pass a, a yeah. it's city owned. Yeah, the, 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 it, it is, a, an internet, you have to get the parties, um, first of all, there's Long Beach is a harbor, right. and we're a harbor. We're tied together, that's where the 43% right. goes. So we have no jurisdiction okay, over Long the, Beach. Okay, just the LA system. Harbor then. Okay, all right, uh, it, it's not just the location there, it's where these trucks are coming from and how they interact across the no, country. No, no, but I'm just saying a simple rule. Harbor, you have to be open 24 hours. 
Well, it's almost open now. I mean, I could there, write the ordinance right now. There actually is right now. Um, many of the haulers uh, are working around the clock. We encourage them to do that, and we've been urging them to do that. Uh, the legislation mm -hmm. aspect hopefully will come at another day. Okay, okay? It, it's necessary. I agree. Yeah. Right. Let me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you, you pose the you pose the idea of having a tunnel under the under the mountains, uh, through the mountains, not under the, the mountains. mountains. Well, they're actually they're actually they're building one from Zurich, Switzerland, all the way to Milan, right. Italy, right now. Right. Yeah, you know. So obviously, if they can do it, we can do it. And the deal sure. is, you know, you jump on the train in Milan, about an hour and a half later, you're in sure. Zurich, Switzerland. Right. You know what I mean? Uh, also, you see in Poland, they're building four thousand miles of uh, of interstate. Um, you know, all around the world, they have these massive infrastructure projects going in, except for here. And the, the annoying thing about it is we have a bigger economy in California than the entire country of China, and I'm pretty sure they're doing more about their infrastructure than we are, because we're really not doing anything. You know, so I understand the frustrations. Um, this is, uh, you're from Long Beach. Um, Okay, yeah, you know, and we're kind of part of the problem because we were <laughs> we were supposed to put Danny this. If you want. Okay, you got it. <laughs> we're supposed to build this uh, this liquid and the natural question gas is, terminal. I'm sorry, but I can't hear. We you. were supposed to build a liquid natural gas terminal, right? In, yeah, the LNG. In Long Beach. Yeah, you know, we messed that one up. So basically, <laughs> the fact of the matter is, we're, we're making a lot of mistakes. I think we have to have more of a go big or go home type of mentality and really start to tackle some of these issues. Uh -huh. You know, rather than just, you know, because for all my life I've been reading the papers about ideas and nothing ever happens, you know. That's well, what let, me, say. let me just say this. We have put a lot of roadblocks in the way. Uh, right after the bonds passed, I was sitting on the next 8 MTA meeting, and I asked the head of Caltrans, that represents District 7, which is L.A., I says, okay, you're going to ha you got the federal money, you're going to get the state money. How soon can you do the 405, which is the busiest freeway in America. And he says, I think we can have it finished by 2012. I know, it's crazy. And I said, that's six years away. He says, yeah, but he says, we got to do the EIR, we got CEQA, we got this, we got that, we got everything else. There's a lot of roadblocks in the way. The only thing we've ever done quickly is when we repaired the 10 after the Northridge earthquake, because right. Dick Reardon says, just do it, we'll worry about it later and it got done within 45 days or 30 days or whatever it was. But that's one of our problems today. We can have these great ideas, but it's gonna take years to affect them because there's so many roadblocks we gotta go through. And we gotta do something about those roadblocks. Yeah. I, can I just add to go that? Ahead, I agree that there are many roadblocks and we do need to get rid of a lot of them. And we are doing that at, at the state level right now by doing uh, collapsing the uh, collapsing and uh, overlapping in terms of time frames. Design the, um, the uh, for instance, EIR processes that are duplicative, we're collapsing them on top of each other so that they run simultaneously instead of you know, one after, the other. one after the other and that kind of thing to try and cut down on the time. When I got into office, there was a, there was a bridge that hadn't been done f over the Alameda Corridor in Wilmington. It, it took two years to get that Caltrans bridge built and it shouldn't have taken two years. So I know about how hard it is to get something built and I was on MTA and I know how hard it is to get that. And it takes personal tenacity on the part of an elected official to get something done in two years. But there is change going on on that because we are fed up. On the other side of the coin, to push things as fast as some in the private sector would want us to, the careful ne the, their care must be taken. We cannot abandon uh, some of these processes because the private sector would have us do it to the point where we abandon our concern about the environment. They want to, I, some would have us abandon the environmental impact report process for the purposes of getting the projects out the door. Mm -hmm. so. And that we have to be careful about because we only have one earth and one environment okay. to give. So it's a balance, it's a balance. Yes, That's all I next would say question. about that. Um, the panel's been speaking a lot about diverting uh, passengers to other airports. Is, are there any plans to divert the 200 million tons of cargo to a lesser used airport to um, reduce the strain on LAX? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, yeah, yeah I, in fact, please. yesterday yeah. I, I met with, with, a, with a major force in that whole industry, and they're going to do it in Ontario. Mm -hmm. And we'll be announcing it publicly and going through that process. Yes, we are doing, as a city, incredible changes at Ontario. That didn't happen just a year ago. Yeah. And that's another one of those examples. What percent of cargo actually comes in the belly of passenger trains? 60%. So th that's really difficult to divert. It's a lot easier to divert the FedExes that's and the correct. UPSs, right? That's right. Yes. Yeah. So go ahead. Um, you're talking a lot about the physical infrastructure and just briefly started to bring up the <clears throat> political infrastructure and the problems that you have, the roadblocks that you have, getting things done because of the political structure, organizational structure. What problems as far as the regionalization of the airport do you foresee or are you going through now because of the political infrastructure, less not physical? Well, actually the political infrastructure is working to our benefit now to achieve regionalism. Uh, because our mayor is supportive of it, he is directing airport staff to establish regional airports. And so Ontario is going to, with the, with the um, addition of Express Jet, uh, there are going to be a million more passengers through Ontario Airport and in the first heard year. Of Express Jet. Yeah. They're, they've been around for 30 years. Oh. Um, yeah, so they're, they're well established. So they're adding you know, 26 flights a day. It's a million more annual passengers at Ontario Airport. So the political infrastructure has actually worked for our benefit since we've had a mayor who was supportive of it. Before that, when we had mayors who were not supportive of it, they really, they kept the, the fees down at LAX, so it cost more to fly out of uh, other airports. They were not supportive of, you know, of making those equal. So, and keeping the business in, in LA so cronies could benefit from it. Um. So, but you mentioned that Burbank is independent, Long Beach is independent, Orange County's airport, John Wayne is independent. So why would they ever agree to be, do, be part of a regional airport system that would then force them to take more uh, flights if they don't want to? Mm, yeah, you know, this is the big issue. Um, and when I'm now chair of this regional airport authority, and right. the first thing we did was drop some provisions that upset Orange County and others, which was uh, eminent domain, uh, um, which was the main main issue, and bonding. They, they did not want to be forced into anything. So what I'm doing right now, we've had two meetings, trying to bring them in from all eight counties, to get everybody to realize <clears throat> we're in this basin together. How can we distribute it appropriately? And we also need the support of the airlines. We can't do it without right. the airlines. So the, if the airlines buy into it, <clears throat> and the cities and the counties buy into it, we will find. There are, I can mention four or five other locations right. where there's great interest by the local governments there to expand their opportunity for, for having more service, it means more jobs, more opportunities community. It's happening for the first time, truly. We've all reached a level of frustration and know that regionalism on every level, I don't care if it's air transportation or ground transportation or housing uh, or homelessness, we all have these problems. And, right. and on my little local level from the transportation, I found $11 million in some pots just sitting there. I'm putting in 32 wow, left-hand... What pots were you looking under? These uh, were <laughs> pots where developers who do commercial development put a certain money aside for traffic mitigation. Oh. We didn't tap into a lot of this money. We have 11 million of it. I'm doing 32 left-hand turn signals. I'm, I'm how, doing about a, how about a pothole over in her neighborhood? <coughs> oh, I told her, if she calls 311 dollars. right now I'll and points it. out that yeah. they will get on it. We have a very efficient pothole strategy that happened in the last few years. Three but on all lines. these issues, I mean, pothole. I was at a meeting just before this, and I gotta leave right after this, about homelessness. <laughs> Okay, I got a huge crisis of homelessness, and I got to find places to create shelters and permanent housing with supportive services. And we're in the middle of that right now in the 11th district because as they do the downtown scene, uh, it increases in Venice and in the surrounding communities here. And I have quite a bit of issues that are challenging for us right now that we can solve if we take political will and, and work together. Hey, well, we want to thank you and have the students thank you. Thank you all. Bless you. Hey, hey, Bill. The price, leave, the price of fuel, gasoline in Europe is about eight, over eight dollars a gallon. Yeah. Okay, we, we know that. The size of our automobiles in the United States is gigantic. Uh, general, I mean, the, the automobile manufacturers keep making these large cars and vehicles to sell to us. California is the largest consumer in the United States of vehicles. 
why have we con continued to buy these huge cars that keep spilling out this into our, uh, into our air? If we're interested in green, what can we do to stop them from continuing to produce these cars that we really can't use in our environment? Senator, you have regulation over this. Well, I used, I used to be chair of the Transportation Committee. Now I'm on the committee, and this is an area that I have done some work in. We have tried in California to incentivize the purchase of hybrid vehicles and uh, other uh, vehicles that are low fuel consumption vehicles. We, as you know, uh, if you have a hybrid vehicle of certain qualifications, you can, uh, for instance, drive in the carpool lane. Uh, and that was legislation that we adopted a couple years ago. We've, you know, tried to come up with ways to encourage the purchase of, of those kinds of vehicles. In terms of working with the auto industry, that is a national, that's really a national issue. And it, there is not really a lot that in California we can do. In fact, on the other hand, um, some say that some of what we've done in California really works counter to the, to the uh, auto industries in, Cal in uh, the United States' best interest. They complain about our air quality, our, our fuel standards. You know, in California, we have um, higher standards for uh, our fuel than a lot of other states. And, and, um, and we sometimes place requirements on vehicles in California uh, for uh, emissions and other kinds of uh, safety standards and other things for the automobiles. We're usually ahead of the curve uh, relative to our automobiles here in California, and uh, the auto dealers and automakers don't really look yeah, but, very kindly on But that applies to us. Toyota and Audi as well as it does to America. It does. Company, it right? applies to everybody, right. but they often complain about us. So well, we it's don't, a free market. It's, if you want to do something, you affect the market. At the price of gasoline, that's there was exactly $8, what they say. $8 a gallon. You wouldn't see any big cars. Well, that's what they that's what they say. Except for, uh, um, we still one, love our cars in California, and we still have big cars. You know, I don't I don't know what the answer is, except that we do try in ways that if anybody has great ideas, we're really open to them. That's why we did the HOV lane thing was in an effort to try and encourage the purchase of low consumption. Or as Arnold say, you know. what's wrong with a big car? Yeah, <laughs> Kevin. All right. Um, so from what it sounds like from this panel, LA is pretty much the worst place to be considering <laughs> transportation. Um, my question for you guys, is there anywhere in the world that's worse off than we are? Yes. Um, oh, Beijing. Sure. Okay. Yeah. London. What, what, oh, are, yeah. what, are those cities, what are those cities trying to do to sort of mitigate this problem? And to, what, are, you know, what are their strategies that they're going for? And what's at the top of our laundry list of things to get done? The very first thing, if you had to say. Hey, we're not alone. There we're not alone. There are a lot, yeah. And yeah. and some of the some of the best strategies uh, cost dollars, you know. Uh, and the be some of the best strategies are mass transit related, you know. I my personal view, and and I'm sure Dave, you have uh, very specific uh, beliefs about this too. But mine are around mass transit, light rail. I think is a great mm -hmm. approach. Um, and I really believe in light rail. And also improving bus systems uh, that are clean, on time, and uh, and uh, you know well coordinated and well connected, along with mm -hmm. light right, light rail systems that are integrated and, and well work well, I think are really um, keys for the future. Uh, even in a, a city like LA that is well spread out. Um, Automobiles and freeway systems are just, we're not going to be able to build enough freeways to build ourselves out in the, in the future. You know, I think like we've got to get into mass transit. In London or Florence and a lot of European cities is when you go into a downtown, the, a camera takes your picture and then charges you an extra fee for yes. being there. Yeah. So every time someone comes up Lincoln Boulevard, they should take a picture of the license plate and charge you a fee. We're considering that. That's, I mean, that's one thing that's, that's out there and it's attached to your DMV fees. Right. So. so if you come from Orange County, you're going to pay more money the closer you get to LAX. And if you go, actually go into the airport, you'd actually pay more for that. Yeah. When I was in China in 1986 in Shanghai, I had 12 million people and 4 million bicycles and about 500 cars. Today, they've got about 
12, no, they got about 18, 20 million people now, and they probably have uh, seven or eight million cars. That's, that's really a mess. That's economic a mess. development. Yes. Yeah. All right, this is going to be a two-parter because I'm going to ask my question, then I'm going to pass my mic to my friend here. Um, while we're down here in Westchester and we're diggering about how to build a monorail or something out to Palmdale in Ontario, San Francisco is opening gleaming new terminals at their airport in Seattle, and airlines have these very fuel-efficient planes that can, you know, fly from Asia and not even stop on the West Coast and just go straight to Las Vegas and Denver and stuff. It seems to me like if we really care about a living wage and we want to increase the income for people who work in Los Angeles, it seems like we should be doing things to improve our number one um, job generators, and that's international trade and logistics, and that's LAX and the ports. Right. Um, and so that's if right. someone wants to play Bill Rosendahl and answer, respond to that, that'd be great. But I'm going to pass this over to my friend. You know the reason that, that they got at San Francisco Airport, the reason they have new terminals and they have more gates to, um, to, for the A380 to land is because they actually had a cooperative effort where airport, community, airlines all work together to put their master plan together. And we haven't been able to do that in LA. That's what we're hoping to achieve. But they, that's how they got, that's why they're ahead of us. Well, the other thing that I think is really key is uh, when you talk about cooperation uh, is I think it's very important that the connectivity is very important b between the transportation modes. And I frankly, when, when it was mentioned about these regional planning groups and all of that, I would like to see, I've got, we've got a bill in right now, Ted Lou's got a bill about establishing a uh, transportation authority for the um, green line that you heard about that is stupid and, and, and ends one mile before going all the way into the airport, which would make it so much easier for people and not have to go park you know, somewhere by the airport and stuff. And people wouldn't have to drive and have all that congestion uh, in the why, airport. Why did that happen? Poli ran, politics. There's a lot of that was reasons. politics. It was, well, it was politics. Well, it was I teach politics. people's I don't know personal what that means. interests. Uh, People's personal interest in politics, not a good, healthy politics. Mm. It was bad politics. Mm -hmm. okay, bad we, politics. But what I'm saying is that I think that that regional plan, there should be planning between the transportation planners and the airport planners so that when they plan any kind of new stuff at the airport, they should plan how to do the transportation linkage with it. Because I think they're making some new plans for improvements at the airport. Right. They should do the transportation piece with it. Well, we're working so that, that it's all connected yeah. and okay. they do it at the same time. We have time for one more question, but we have, who wants to ask a question? Ray, Ray, you do, okay, you, okay. Here's what we're gonna do. We got four questions, and so the panelists are, are gonna have to, uh, ladies, you're gonna have to, uh, ladies? Sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> She's very Doing enthusiastic over here. All right. all right, we're gonna get four questions asked right now in a row without four answering. In a row? Yeah, and, mm -hmm. and you're going to have to uh, give a response that weaves an answer to all four. Whoa. Okay. So, uh, One response that answers all four? Yeah, let's, Ooh, let's, uh, let's see, okay. <laughs> so did you get that instruction, Senator? <laughs> Senator, you I'm have the instructions? Sorry. I was doing a little business there, sorry. What? It's your turn. For what? <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I wasn't paying attention. I'm oh, sorry. Oh, man, just like a student. Just like in uh, school, sorry. Anyway. <laughs> just like a suit? Okay. Student, I said. Oh, student. Okay. What? All right, here's, we're yes, going to have Dr. four Gara. questions. We're going to have four questions asked, okay? And you're going to have to give a response that weaves an answer to all four, okay? So there's a first one, one over response. there. One response. One response. Yes, first yes, one no there. one maybe. <laughs> <laughs> all right, my question is, um, how are these bonds going to be paid back? And also, how why what? you stated how are the bonds going to be paid back? Senator oh. Oropoza? Yes, yes, You yes. said um, we only act until there's a crisis. I mean, why wait until there's a crisis? Why can't we be proactive and right. solve these problems yes. right away? Okay, Ray okay. Ray. Oh, I was just going to ask about the package of safety space and how that affects Okay, what is AB 32? It's an environmental safety plan. That, okay. I don't know, what does honey, it do? I don't know. Okay, we'll talk just about car carbon I dioxide emissions. I'm for it. Uh, yeah, Jennifer, go ahead. I mean, excuse me. Go ahead. Okay, right over here.
compliance with what? Kyoto. Oh, Kyoto. Kyoto. Or, Kyoto. Yeah, or okay. lack of compliance. All right. Oh, Somebody else had a question? Damn, Any I missed I miss the second. Okay, the no, second no, part it's uh, how, how are we going to how are we going to pay bonds? Mm -hmm. Why do we always wait for a crisis? Mm -hmm. uh, AB thirty two. I don't know. Okay, uh, policy regarding mass transit. How do uh, are we in compliance or out of compliance of Kyoto? And how do we mobilize at the local level to get the feds to um, okay. to response? All right. Okay, since um, Commissioner Velasco was paying the most attention. She goes first. And writing notes okay. like a like a good student. I know you were an A student, weren't you? She got an I a. was an A student. Yeah, I was just yeah. sitting in the front row, yeah. also. Yeah, <laughs> you, you look like an A student. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that as a compliment. I, I think a, maybe a one sentence response really is social responsibility. You play an active role in things that happen in your environment and your state. Vote. Make your politicians responsible to you. Doesn't really answer the re repayment of bonds, but no. Well. The senator will take care of that. No. <laughs> Mr. Fleming? Uh, how we're going to pay for the bonds? Uh, really simple. Uh, these bonds are just a fraction of our gross national product in California. We're going to have plenty of money over the course of many, many years to pay those bonds. We did before. We will again. Um, you know, Tip O'Neill made a great comment one time when he said, all politics is local. And it is. The fact we're talking about LAX here indicates all politics is local. And, uh, and I think the question was brought up about, you know, how do we get people engaged? I've got a theory that, you know, Steve Soberoff will probably disagree with me. I know Dick Reardon did. But we have a city that uh, is 450 square miles in size. You could put Manhattan. San Francisco, St. Louis, Minneapolis, and Boston, all in Los Angeles, and still have room. And yet, we have one seat of government, which everybody has to go to, and today traffic means it's two to three hours to go from where you live to where you're governed. I really believe that a borough or a district system would work better in Los Angeles, and we don't have time to talk about it. But sometime I'd like to come down and, and discuss it with you because I think this is the answer. I think that's why you have a 7% turnout because people feel totally disconnected with city government and local government should be the most important government they have. Uh, Senator? Okay, I've got some controversial answers and well, okay. All right, pay for it. We pay through it uh, through the regular budget process. It's just going to be budgeted every year to, uh, when it's time to pay off the bonds. It's like bonds are like a loan and it'll be through the regular you state know what? budget. I kind of I budget, but I never pay my credit cards off. I don't get, how, do, <laughs> okay. how does that work? It's like a home loan. We, we have to. It's like a loan and it's going it, oh, it, to, okay. we have a commitment. We have to pay it before we even pay for it. It's like a on the top of the call list no, of, no, no. of the responsibilities. Me oh, hush you, <laughs> be quiet. All right, I don't, I don't have that long to do this, right? Because okay, students want to get out of we here. We are the seventh largest economy All right. in the yeah, world. We, we, have, we will, thank you. We will have enough money to pay it off. But, but I'm not gonna promise, promise on that that we're gonna have enough money to do everything we wanna do. And so, you know, we always have money problems in the state, often. <laughs> crisis management, on the issue of crisis management, that criticism is very fair. And a couple of solutions uh, or suggested solutions on that, things that would make that better are very controversial. And because this is probably, could be the last office I ever run for, or even if it isn't, I'm gonna say them anyway, okay? Here it is. This is the problem. Number one, we have term limits, all right? So that is a problem because uh, we are always in crisis management. We're always in crisis management because we have term limits and so people don't have become experts, all right? They don't have a long enough time to really learn the craft, learn the issues, and become experts. In the old days, people, 
were in office longer, and so they developed expertise. And so they became experts in a topic area. Right now so, we're doing- So how many years do you need to be an expert? Here at Loyola Marymount, you only need four years to be an Is expert. Is that right? <laughs> well, okay, maybe you're smarter. But some, you know, I mean, I've been, I've been in the legislature for six years. I now consider myself sort of, sort of an expert in transportation, kind of. But, and so maybe I can kind of develop some, some policy issues around, around transportation. But I've been thrown into the area of revenue and taxation now. Okay, I'm gonna have eight years, God willing, to do some work in revenue and taxation if I, be, if I continue to be the chair of that committee. But maybe I won't, and you know, term limits are a problem, okay, I believe. The second thing is maybe if we stay with term limits, maybe the terms should be longer. You know, if we have two terms, maybe they should be longer terms. Right now in the assembly, every two years you have to run for office. So you're constantly, instead of developing your time and you're uh, developing your expertise, you're always on the treadmill running for office. This is another problem with crisis management, all right, my view. On mass transit, how do we attract people to mass transit? I believe we make that trans mass transit clean, easy to get to, so lots of park and ride stations where people can, Californians are not gonna walk, y'all. It just won't happen. So we make it accessible. We have park and ride where people can go to the stations, get on the transit. We make sure it runs often so that, it, again, people can get to it and get to where they want to go. We make it very safe so people feel comfortable on the mass transit, and we make sure that the schedules run on time so that people can be assured that they get where they're going to on time. And we advertise, advertise, promote, promote, and make it a middle-class way of traveling. And I think with those kinds of things, mass transit will work. And on mobilization at and, the and local- And finally, and finally, this is the last issue, on mobilizing at the local level. It is critical to affecting legislators. We listen. It is very important. Use email, phone calls, faxes, come and visit. Emails are, are very effective as well as any other kind of communication. It does make a difference. We do listen. Wow. You have done something that I have not been able to do in 23 years that I've taught here. Class ended five minutes ago, but I'm watching and not putting their books away. Hey, let's thank our panelists for... Uh... That's impressive. Okay, see you guys next week. Thank you very much.